Hi, I'm Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Volaction. This video is part of my lean training system. It was originally released as a DVD a long time ago, but times have changed and the look of some of these LTS videos is now a bit dated. The content is still spot on though. So rather than just discontinue the line, I am posting the majority of each of the 36 videos here with the remainder available at Volaction Videos. That's our video service where you can download a wealth of supporting content and watch subscriber only videos. I recommend subscribing and hitting the notification button if you want to make sure you don't miss any new content. I would also really appreciate if you would hit the like button if this video is helpful and you want to see more content similar to it. The like button helps us get found on YouTube, but it also lets us figure out where you want us to put our future effort. Now enjoy the free version of this video. Welcome to Volaction Continuous Improvement's overview presentation on using Kanban for visual material management. I am Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Volaction. Most of the tools in any Lean Toolkit are intended to solve a specific problem. So let's start off by talking about the one simple problem that faces companies in regards to their materials management. That problem is the Goldilocks Syndrome. They either have too much inventory or not enough. What we are really looking for is the just right. Not too much and not too little. Now granted, there are some specific reasons that inventory is not exactly as needed. Let's start out by talking about what causes too little inventory. As you can see from this list, there is no shortage of reasons that production teams find the cupboard bare when they're looking for a specific part. Items may come in defective, whether from quality issues or from damage during shipping. In this case, the shortage is not the total number of items available, but rather the total number of usable items on hand. Loss can occur as a result of poor materials management practices or, in some cases, from theft. Incorrect or late deliveries add to the problem. Sometimes, the quantities that you want to keep on hand are simply not enough. And finally, production materials tend to have a shelf life. Sometimes this is spoilage in the case of food products, but more commonly it is obsolescence. This is especially true for companies that build high-tech products. It is also true for companies that take a very hands-on approach to engineering and make frequent changes. The bottom line, though, is that there are many different reasons for stockouts. The other half of the Goldilocks problem is having too much material. There are a handful of specific problems that contribute to excess inventory. Large batch sizes, often the result of long setups, are one of the major culprits. It takes a long time to cycle through producing components. That means that every time a machine is changed over to a new part number, the operator has to produce enough to last until he or she works through all the other part numbers and can make the part in question again. Sometimes that can take weeks. Suppliers also contribute to excess inventory. Most often, this is due to their ordering policies. They may have a minimum order quantity that they will accept, or they ship in pack quantities that exceed short-term demand. Long lead times also compound this issue. But these reasons are only part of the problem and, for some companies, are a very minor part of it. A significant cause of excess inventory is often hedging against running out. Most companies see too little inventory as a much more serious problem than having too much. For that reason, they will keep far more inventory on hand than is immediately needed. The effect of this, not surprisingly, is that large piles of these material buffers permeate the workplace. I hope you are getting something valuable out of this video. If you want to get more out of this program, we recommend watching it on Volaction Videos. You'll be able to watch the entire video, mostly ad-free, and view subscriber-only programs. You'll also have access to a load of continuous improvement downloads. Of course, there are costs associated with both too little and too much inventory. The number one problem is that if you do not have something to sell, you cannot sell it. In some cases, the problem is even worse if you thought you would have enough and run out. This may cause you to incur contractual penalties. And of course, there are also plenty of administrative costs that you incur as a result of shortages of materials. 
you may spend time looking for items that are not in the correct location. This can include running down to the loading dock to see if it came in yet, checking warehouses, or searching to see if the needed items were simply misplaced. If you eventually come to the conclusion that you don't have what you need, you'll often have to reorder the items, possibly with an added cost, to get the items quicker. Similarly, there are costs associated with having too much material. Many of these expenses fall into a category called holding costs. You may even see taxes on the inventory you have on hand. The bottom line is that the more inventory you have, the more you will be paying on top of the actual cost of the goods. But there is also another major cost that is often overlooked. All of the money that is tied up in inventory is unavailable for use elsewhere. At the most basic level, this means that the money is not available to distribute to investors. But the problem goes deeper than that. Doing nearly anything in the company costs money. If you want to expand into a new market, it takes money to set up distribution channels and to advertise. If you want to create a new product, you need to invest in research and development. So where does that money come from? Well, initially, it comes from investors. But investors prefer to get money out of the company, not continuously add to it. Accepting money from new investors means that current investors own just a little bit less of the company. That makes new investment rather unappealing. The next option is to take out a loan. Loans have costs, though. You have to pay the interest, but there are also administrative costs to getting it, and often there are restrictions placed on a company when they are indebted. Of course, the company could pass on opportunities. That, however, means leaving money, often a substantial amount of it, on the table. By far, the best option is to reduce the amount of working capital, that's the money that's tied up in running the business, to free up cash to invest in these opportunities. The more money that is locked up in inventory, the less the leadership team will have available to it to pursue its strategies. So let's switch gears a bit now and talk about how that inventory gets into the company in the first place. For most companies, there are two basic ordering methods. The first, and the one that is most common in smaller organizations, is a hodgepodge of manual ordering processes. For larger companies, those that have deeper pockets and more resources, Computerized ordering systems are fairly common. Both of these, though, have some drawbacks. Manual ordering takes a lot of effort to do properly, and even then it is often prone to errors. There's also the issue that manual ordering can sometimes take quite a while to complete. That means that when the item is used up, the person doing the ordering may not place the order in a timely fashion. Manual ordering is also removed from the process there is nothing linking it to production in most cases. Variation in usage, whether up or down from the plan, is not visible in a timely manner to the person doing the ordering. These problems exacerbate the Goldilocks syndrome. Computerized ordering systems, namely ERP or Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, have limitations of their own. The first, and the one I mentioned earlier, is that there can be a huge initial investment required to put an ERP system in place. And even with a good system, the ordering process is only as good as the data going into it. ERP systems are notoriously susceptible to inaccuracy. If parts are not properly accounted for in the production line, the inventory numbers get out of whack. Parts disappear for a variety of reasons. Service teams sometimes commandeer them. Engineers use them for experimentation. Sometimes they are misplaced or dropped. On occasion, they are broken and find their way into the trash without being accounted for. Over time, without continuous upkeep, ERP systems become less and less accurate. As part of the lean training system this video comes from, we offer a variety of lean LEGO training packages. These include our lean LEGO flow simulation, mistake proofing or pokey oak lean LEGO exercise, and our visual controls and 5S lean LEGO exercise. We've also got an office flow simulation for those not implementing continuous improvement on the shop floor. Click the links in the description below or click on cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. So what's the alternative? Kanban. Now Kanban is a Japanese term meaning signboard. To clarify a bit, 
A Kanban is simply a visual communication tool used to manage inventory. Now, as the story goes, Kanban can trace its origins to a group of Japanese engineers visiting the U.S. supermarket system after World War II. They were led by Taiichi Ono from Toyota, who is widely considered to be the father of modern lean. He reportedly emulated this replenishment system at Toyota, where it has continued to evolve to this day. Now that you have a little bit more information about what a Kanban is, let's talk about what I'd like you to learn from this presentation. Of course, I'd love for you to come away with an understanding of what a Kanban is. I'd also like for you to learn how to use several varieties of Kanban signals. And finally, I'd like you to get enough information to get started on developing your own Kanban system. Let's get a bit more specific about what a Kanban is. Specifically, let's watch a two-bin Kanban system in action. Imagine you are in an assembly area and you pull a component from a bin of parts. You would install this item and then give your work to the next process in line. You would repeat this until the bin is empty. At this point, you would remove the Kanban card from the bin and send it to the defined Kanban collection point. You would then remove the empty first bin and start pulling from the second full bin. You then continue to produce as normal. In the meantime, the fabrication area is producing the parts to fill the order you have in effect placed with them when you sent them the Kanban card. When the replacement bin is full, the fabrication team delivers it to assembly. You notice that this now looks very similar to the situation at the beginning of this demonstration. The process would be repeated over and over and over again to keep the system running. Note that the Kanban process is rather simple for each person to do their own part. This means that the system will continue to run without a lot of process oversight. That's not to say that you don't need to manage a system. It just means that once everything is in place, the visual nature of Kanban makes it very easy to keep materials flowing. Now that we know what it is, let's talk about what Kanban isn't. There are a few common misconceptions about Kanban. The first is that Kanban is an inventory reducer. In most cases, this is true. People tend to have too much inventory on hand, and once it is actively managed, they realize that. In some cases, though, people are running a bit too close to the bone. Setting up the Kanban may identify that more inventory is necessary. The second misconception is that a Kanban is a cure-all for inventory problems. Kanban does not make suppliers perform better. They do not raise the quality of the part. And they do not make people follow the proper process. In fact, Kanban is something of the opposite of a cure-all. It makes problems very apparent and forces you to address them. The bottom line is that for a Kanban system to be effective, it must have good supporting processes in place. And finally, Kanban systems are not waste-free. They're basically the lesser of two evils. There is a tremendous amount of effort that goes into setting up a Kanban system, producing cards, moving them around, managing the system, and so on. All this activity consumes resources, and Kanbans do not actually add value, so they are waste. The key is that it has less waste associated with it than other inventory management systems. But make no mistake, a Kanban system is not something to be proud of or to aspire to. It is a red flag. It means you do not have flow. Think of an assembly line. There is no need for Kanban systems between stations that are closely linked. The material just smoothly proceeds from one person to the next. A Kanban means that processes are not co-located, or it means that batches are too large. This is probably the biggest drawback to Kanban. Once it is established, the pain associated with inventory management diminishes. People accept it as the end state, and it can breed complacency. Fortunately, Kanban is not a foreign concept to most people. There are many real-world examples that people can relate to. Checkbooks are probably the closest example people have to actual Kanban systems. At the front of one of the books toward the end of the print run, you will find a reorder form. When you get to that form and turn it in, you start the reorder process. It is a visual signal that is hard to miss. 
Another common example of reorder signals is Netflix. When one DVD is returned, it acts as a signal to send another one. And finally, the example that started it all. While it is not a Kanban in the truest sense of the word, the rapid inventory turnover in dairy products is based on numerous small orders to keep from having aging inventory in the system. As you learn more about Kanban, you'll see that none of these examples are perfect. They do, however, show that using visual controls to manage inventory is intuitive. Now, let's look at an actual example of a Kanban. Full Action Continuous Improvement sells numerous DVDs. With such a wide variety, we need a bulletproof method to keep us from running out. Kanban fits that bill. Notice in this image that we have a two-bin system in place. The box in back is full, and the one in front has only one DVD remaining. When this final DVD is sold, we pull the Kanban card from the back of the box and send it to our production area. The back box is then moved forward and the empty box is placed into a holding area. We draw from the second box while the production area works to produce the DVDs on the Kanban card that was dropped. The production area delivers the full box when it is complete, and it is then placed behind the partial box. Again, note that this final image looks very similar to the original image. The Kanban process is an endless cycle. So why do we do Kanban? Well, there are several reasons. Most of them have been mentioned at least in some form already. There are, however, two that are much more important than the other ones. The first is that Kanban creates pull. This is a fundamental shift in how people look at their workload. Pull systems link the operation together in a way that push systems simply cannot do. Perhaps even more important is the fact that Kanban forces leaders to actively manage their material management systems. We'll talk later about how to intentionally stress the system, but for now, let's just keep in mind that Kanban forces everyone to be much more involved in managing their materials. Let's look at these benefits in more detail. We'll start with push versus pull. Let's compare the two ways work flows by thinking of a chain. Imagine trying to push a chain. If the chain was long enough, the person at the other end would have no idea you are trying to push it. As a result, you may continue to feed chain even if something is going wrong. That tends to compound problems. And because of the lack of communication, any changes to the production plan forces excessive coordination. So now, let's look at pull. If somebody is holding the other end of the chain and gives it a tug, no matter where you are or how far upstream you are, you will feel it. This immediate feedback also helps with balancing the line. If somebody cannot keep up with the pace, that imbalance in workload becomes very apparent. Pull also helps to bring problems front and center. If something goes wrong, it doesn't take long for the impact to be felt throughout the chain. The person at the far end will be tugging and will not be able to get any slack. The person at the near end will simply stop feeling any tugging and will know not to produce. One of the other benefits, if you recall, is that Kanbans make your materials management processes much more visual. Watch the screen carefully as I briefly show you a set of images. Think of the two images. How many eggs were supposed to be in each container? How many were there? And how many were missing? With the visual nature of the container on the right, those questions are very easy to answer. Kanbans provide very similar at-a-glance type of information. You can look at a bin and know immediately if the materials are supposed to be there. You can easily tell when it is time to reorder, and the cards let you know exactly how much you need. Most importantly, when there are empty spaces, the shortages stand out. Another benefit of Kanban is that it attaches information to materials. Without Kanban, it is difficult to tell whether the material is where it is supposed to be. One of the rules of Kanban is that materials cannot move without a Kanban card. That relationship gives you confidence that materials are moving as planned. 
Kanban cards do more than just provide you information, though. They act as a ticket that authorizes you to produce or order materials. The big benefit of this is that it limits overproduction. You only produce what is needed when it is needed. Those limits help make inefficiencies in processes readily apparent. People learn that looking busy is less important than only working on the right things. Another big benefit of Kanban is that it puts a management focus on the flow of materials. First, this forces leaders to make active decisions rather than be reactive to problems or take a passive approach to managing materials. What do I mean by this? Well, leaders often let their material systems manage them. They spend a great deal of their time dealing with problems or trying to make sure that they don't run out of materials. With Kanban in place, leaders have more options on how to manage their processes. Kanbans also highlight weaknesses in production systems. Because there is much less safety net to operate with, problems such as quality issues, excessive lead times, or unreliable suppliers become focal points for corrective actions. The waste is there whether you have Kanban in place or not. Without Kanban, though, it is harder to see it. The final way Kanban support active management is that they make abnormalities apparent. When something breaks in the Kanban system, it stands out. You can walk up to any part of the Kanban system and immediately tell what is going on. If cars are missing, it is easy to notice. If too much material is on hand, it jumps out at you. If the supermarket is short on parts, there is no mistaking it. The bottom line is that Kanbans give managers additional levers and dials and gauges to use in managing their operations. So let's look at how the whole Kanban system works together. And to do this, we will focus on the interactions between an upstream and downstream process. Let's start with the processes of the downstream operator. The primary responsibility is to make sure that cards are turned in properly. Some of the cards are sent directly to the upstream process. Others are sent to a Kanban collection point, often called a Kanban post. These posts would contain purchased items or cards that go to work areas that are not located close to the downstream process. The downstream operator also has several other responsibilities. Most of these relate to maintaining the health of the system. They need to be trained to identify problems or opportunities with the levels of materials. Basically, that means they have to be able to recognize if there is too much safety stock or not enough. Of course, they also need to watch for damaged cards and to make sure that the card data is accurate. The upstream operator also has several processes that they need to follow to maintain the flow of materials. The most important is that they only produce when there is a card telling them to do so. It is also important to maintain the sequence of the cards. Shuffling the cards to create larger batches will create stockouts. Material handlers also have several processes that they must follow. One of the more important ones is to empty out the Kanban posts so the cards don't stagnate. This should be done on a regular schedule. They are also the ones who are responsible for maintaining and producing cards. Another big job they have is to maintain a Kanban board for purchases. We'll talk about this in more detail later, but the purchase board provides a visual look at the flow of materials. It also makes it convenient for the material handler to match cards up with incoming components. It is probably worth noting that there is a special type of material handler called a water strider. This person has a specific route that they follow moving materials. The key is standardization. They must follow the route on a precise schedule to keep materials flowing properly. And finally, the leadership team has a great deal of responsibility. They own the system, which also means making sure people know how to use it properly. Going back to the active management discussion, Managers also need to continually stress the system. Often this means reducing Kanban quantities to put pressure on production teams to reduce change over time or to solve quality problems, things of that nature. Keep in mind that cranking down on these dials just identifies problems. Leaders are still responsible for taking corrective action on them. This often comes in a form of countermeasures. And finally, leaders have to make tough decisions regarding vendors. Often, the low-cost vendor simply cannot provide the right service to keep a Kanban system flowing. 
They may require excessively large purchases or have exceptionally long lead times. Fortunately, more and more vendors are getting used to working with just-in-time companies. This means that leaders will likely be able to find a vendor that is a good match for your needs. Get more out of our Lean Training System videos with our Continuous Improvement Companion. It's closing in on a thousand pages of great content. It is currently available as a download with a subscription to Vlaction Videos and as a license through our store. You can also get a free version of it by signing up for our newsletter. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. One of the most visual components of the Kanban system is the Kanban card. This is most often a laminated card that is attached to a location with Velcro. It contains a variety of important information to keep the material flowing. The specific information that you keep on your cards can vary depending upon your needs. You may also see things like pack quantity, and nearly all cards nowadays have a barcode on them to assist in ordering. Now, not all Kanbans are created equal. Ordinary Kanbans signal upstream internal groups to produce. Signal, or triangle Kanban, which we will talk about in more detail later, basically manage reorder points. Purchase Kanbans look nearly identical to ordinary Kanbans, but are a different color. You may also see purchase Kanbans color-coded to specific vendors that provide a large number of parts. And finally, you will see a white card. This is a special one-time use Kanban. It is not laminated and is thrown away rather than being recirculated. As you can probably guess, this card is used when you have a spike in demand or a special order that would break your normal flow of materials. These cards must be coordinated in advance so that everybody knows they are coming. So why are they used? The big reason is to maintain the integrity of the system. You could just place a special order for parts and have them show up. But if you have people trained properly, they should question why there is this excess inventory in their work area. The white cards act as communication tools so people know that this excessive inventory is authorized. I mentioned the Kanban board earlier when talking about the responsibilities of the material handler. Note that the numbers on the board correspond to the days of the month. In this case, let's assume that today is the 5th. There is one card on the hook corresponding to today's date. That means that there is one order that has yet to arrive. On a team that is focused on improving the material flow, you would also expect to see the majority of the cards on the board due in the near future. The quantity of items indicated on a Kanban card is directly related to the lead time. Since we want to reduce inventory, that means more frequent, smaller orders, and that requires shorter lead times. Kanban boards also have special locations for late orders. These should receive special attention from the material handler, as you would expect that the production team is rapidly burning through their safety stock. Managers should also make sure that late orders are tracked and problem vendors are either corrected or replaced. Speaking of problem vendors, the Kanban board also provides you with a visual look at vendors that have excessive lead times. If there are cards that are hanging three or four weeks out, it should be a cue to talk to those vendors. This video comes from Velaction's Lean Training System, which takes a module-based approach to learning about continuous improvement. Modules include a PowerPoint presentation and student guides for every video, plus there are many exercises and quizzes as well. There's also a whole host of supporting content in the form of terms in our Continuous Improvement Companion and downloadable articles. Our modules are currently available in our store and as downloads at Velaction Videos. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. Production teams also may have some form of production board to track incoming Kanban cards. This can become more complicated for teams that have many part numbers. In this example, though, there are five part numbers that are supplied to supermarkets. A supermarket is simply a rack with a variety of parts that can be pulled by a downstream process depending on what it has to build. As those racks are depleted, the signals return and are placed into the Kanban board. This is a strong visual management tool because there is one square for every Kanban card that exists. 
the Kanban would either be in the supermarket or on the production board. You can take a quick look at the board and see the status of your materials. As materials from the supermarket get used up, the cards start to pile up in the columns of the production board. And as these cards circulate, they reach the trigger lines. The priority goes to those parts that are above the red trigger lines, and then to those that are closest to it. You have to decide on the location of these triggers and the number of cards to match your demand mix. The production team can build any item they have a Kanban card for. They do not have to wait until the trigger lines are reached. That is just for prioritization. But if they do not have a card, they cannot build. In practice, though, there will likely always be cards on the board. If the board is always empty and the supermarket is always full, you have excess capacity and should do some line balancing. I mentioned earlier that one of the biggest misconceptions about Kanban is that it reduces inventory. The truth is that it merely enables the reduction of inventory. If you have problems that are buried below piles of inventory, you'll have the same problems once you migrate to a Kanban system. If you simply remove inventory, you will run out of parts. I'm going to stress this point one final time. Kanban is not a magic bullet that will automatically get rid of inventory. You still have to do the work to fix the underlying problems. There are a number of rules that you must follow if you want your Kanban system to operate effectively. Rule number one is that you can only ask for materials in the quantities that are specified on your Kanban cards. And the flip side of rule number one is that you cannot produce or order materials unless it is asked for with a Kanban card. To help control the flow of materials, items can only move when there is a Kanban card attached to them. Rule number four exists primarily to keep fabrication areas from batching multiple cards into one production run. By doing so, they can reduce their number of setups. This, however, increases lead time for other cards and can potentially lead to stockouts. Rule number five is extremely important. As your Kanban system matures, you will slowly bleed out excessive inventory. Thanks for watching this extended free version of our Lean Training System module video. If you want to watch the whole video, check it out at Velaction Videos. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next LTS video that we post, please be sure to subscribe down below. We also always appreciate likes as it helps us get viewed more and makes us keep adding additional content. Thanks for watching and best wishes on your continuous improvement journey.